Hi, and thanks for joining me today. I wanna to talk to you today about recovery from exercise. And I know this is a little bit of a controversial topic and there's a lot of different thought processes and theories about this, but I wanna give you an overview idea and understanding of all the different components you can do because there are some things which are really, really important and there are some things which people think are important which really aren't that important at all. So I wanna run you through it today. So first thing I want to understand is that when we talk about recovery from activity, there really are three different aspects of that to begin with. Uh, the first one is immediate recovery. What do you do here and now? I've just finished my run, what am I gonna do? I've just finished a training session, what am I gonna do? The next one is what is our short-term recovery process? So what we're talking about this is what happens over the next couple of days? How do we deal with it? We know that delayed onset muscle soreness, which is that soreness you get after you've done a, a training session, we know delayed onset muscle soreness peaks at about 48 to 72 hours later. So if you've done a hard session on Monday, you won't feel the, the uh, effects of that necessarily until uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, so we need to make sure we understand that because quite often we pull up Tuesday, we're not feeling too bad and go do another session and bang, now we've got real problems come Thursday, okay? So short term, long term then. Long term is well, how do we structure a training program to prevent injury, to prevent overtraining? How do we recover week to week, month to month, etc., etc., etc.? So there are three basic things that we need to look at with this. So let's break them down a little bit one by one. Okay, so let's look at the immediate stuff to begin with. So when we're looking at immediate, what we're really talking about is you've just finished your main session, now what do you do? So one of the things that most people don't understand is the concept of a cool down. So for most people, cool down basically means go for a bit of walk, do a couple of stretches so you don't get stiff and move on and go home. Okay, we need to understand the process of a cool down. So when you exercise, especially if you're exercising at high intensity or putting a lot of demand on oxygen supply to muscles, which often happens after you've been training for 30 or 40 minutes or competing for 30 or 40 minutes, the result of that basically is that you have capillaries open up that don't normally allow that much blood flow through them. And the result is muscle fibers that don't normally get a huge amount of blood supply now are. That's a great thing when you're competing and when you're training and performing because it gives you the ability to perform at a higher level. And this is a part of our warm up. This is the intention of it, is to get more blood, more oxygen to those muscles that are really important. It helps prevent fatigue, helps improve performance, etc., etc. When we're cooling down, the exact opposite thing plays a part. So in order to get those capillaries open, your blood pressure and your heart rate have to go up, especially your blood pressure. And as that goes up, that gives us the ability to get blood into those areas. Now here's the catch. Once you've been training for a period of time, especially been working hard, you've now got all those muscle fibers that aren't used to getting huge amounts of blood supply, getting huge amounts of blood supply, and they're now also producing huge amounts of waste. So you need to get rid of that waste. The catch is if you just sit still, stop, maybe do a few stretches, blood pressure rapidly drops, which means blood supply drops, and the result of that is the capillaries aren't open enough to push all that waste product, all that lactic acid out of the area. I'm not being a little bit simplified there, but that's the gist of how it kind of works. So when we are cooling down, the first thing we need to do is we need to keep our blood pressure up, keep our heart rate a little bit up, but decrease muscular waste. So what that basically means, progressively reducing your heart rate. So if this is us here, and our heart rate was up here, say we're at 150. What we wanna do over about 15 minutes or so is progressively reduce our heart rate back to that resting level. And by doing that, we're not stressing the muscular system out and our energy mechanisms out, so you're not producing waste products, but on the other side of it is you're still flushing the system clean. And if we do this properly, you should find that you don't feel stiff and achy at the end of a session. A lot of that stiff and achiness is because we're not getting blood out of the area, we're not getting waste product out of the area and we get adhesions formed. Okay, so the first one is cool down properly. That's the real creep critical key, that's the most important thing, and most people fail to do that. The second one is to rest, okay? We need to give our bodies a chance to recover. So that doesn't mean, hey, I did a session in the morning, I'm gonna go out in the afternoon and do it again. If you're an elite level athlete, you may recover that quickly, but for the average person, you're not gonna recover that quickly. So what you're just doing is compounding fatigue on top of fatigue, and this sets off stress responses. Those stress responses activate your flight or fight response, and the net result of chronic inflammation, more damage, etc. So we don't want to overtrain, okay? 
Next one is nutrition. Nutrition is really important. There's several different aspects of nutrition that are important. One is inflammation control. The next is glycogen replenishment, which is the glucose that we use within muscles and within your liver. And the third one is muscular repair. And all these three things are important. So with glycogen, to get glycogen back on, we basically need to eat. Same as with our repair, uh, we need to eat. So in order to get muscular repair, we need the right level of amino acids, so proteins going into the system. And in order to get glycogen replenishment, uh, we need to get carbohydrate into the system, although we can do that somewhat from protein. What combination you need, how much you need, really is dependent upon what you're doing. So if you're a endurance athlete and you're doing two, three hour runs, four, five hour bike rides, you kind of need to look at things a little bit differently than if you've just been to the gym and done a, a massive gym session. Okay, they're, they're very different things. The main one is that one aspect you need glycogen replenishment really quickly, the other we need muscular repair uh, quicker. So they change from time to time with different things you're doing. Likewise, if you're just exercising to lose weight, fat metabolism becomes really critical, so therefore eating immediately isn't so important. We want a body to burn as many of those fat calories as we can. So these two things, what you should eat after an event, really is very um, dependent upon the individual, the type of training they're doing. So we won't go into that too much detail. What we will go into is inflammation, because this is a real critical one that most people don't understand. So when we look at inflammation and we look at our fats, these are unsaturated fats. Okay, so these are our liquid oils, things like olive oil, flaxseed oil, these type of oils are the ones we're talking about. We can simplify them down by breaking them into three categories. So we have our type one, which is our omega-6s that we derive from plant oils um, or vegetable oils. Our omega-6s that we derive from animal fats, which we create as type two. And our type three are our omega-3 fats. So these are more like your fish oils, flaxseed oil, things like this. What we need to understand that all three of these things are important. We need inflammation for tissue repair. Okay, so don't get wrong and say inflammation is, is bad. That's not the case, you need it. But chronic inflammation and over um, exaggerated inflammation is a massive problem, okay? So we need to separate those a little bit. So what we know is our type one fats go down and form pro-inflammatory fats. Our type two, two go, sorry, uh, type two go down and form anti-inflammatory fats and our type three go down and form pro-inflammatory fats. Now there's a real key thing which is very important here, and that is there is a pathway involving an enzyme called the D5D enzyme, which converts these omega-6s across into these omega-6s. So we convert our type 1 into a type 2 fat. The result is we reduce, um, oh, sorry, this is the other wrong way around. This should be anti-inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. I've got them mixed up, sorry guys. Um, so what we do here is by converting these across, what we end up doing is we increase the amount of pro-inflammatory fats that we're producing and we decrease the anti-inflammatory fats that we're producing. Okay, so we change that structure around. And this is a real common cause of, of systemic pro-inflammation. So if you wake up in the morning and feeling stiff and achy, this is a common cause of it, where we're just producing too many pro-inflammatory fats, but it doesn't mean you're eating too many animal fats, you may be activating this pathway. So this pathway is an important one. And I know you're dying to know what uh, activates this because the biggest thing that does this more than anything is the hormone insulin. So when we start becoming insulin resistant or we have high amounts of carbohydrate, high glycemic foods in our diet, this is why they become pro-inflammatory. They push this pathway like crazy. So this is what we need to control. So in order to get chronic inflammation down, control systemic inflammation, recover better, we need to make sure insulin is under control, which means sticking to a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet compared to the standard Western world and making sure our, uh, our glucose, in other words, our, our sugar regulation works really well and also making sure that we are sticking to low GI foods and not refined sugars and things like that, which stimulate this pathway like crazy. But there are a whole lot of things you can do to switch this pathway off and influence this area here as well. Now this is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to change your diet, okay? You can't outrun a, a bad diet, but you can lessen the effects, we'll say. Because we need to understand these insulin changes that are happening here are also happening in the brain, and we're gonna get to neurocognition in a second. But a few things that we know. So the first one is turmeric and fish oil 
both affect this pathway. And this is one of the ways that these things are anti-inflammatory. We also know magnesium, ginger, and garlic affect this pathway. There are tons of other foods that do it as well. Shiitake mushrooms will affect that pathway. So there's a lot of these things that we can use as anti-inflammatory products that we can just include in our diet that will make a big difference to this area here. But again, the biggest thing to do is get the insulin under control. That's the biggest thing out of all of this. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about with this as well is stress, because this is really important. So when we uh, elevate our stress levels, we tend to elevate cortisol levels. This changes precursors called pregnenolone, and the result of that is we lower our progesterone levels and elevate estrogen levels. And this is more, more in tune with women than men, but this is generally what happens. Now, the reason this is important is because low levels of progesterone stimulate this pathway and create more inflammation, and high levels of estrogen stimulate this pathway and create more inflammation. So stress becomes really, really important. We need to keep stress under control. So if we go back a page again, and we come back to here, rest, adequate rest becomes really, really important because if we're overtraining, pushing too hard, not recovering day to day, we create stress, and the result of that stress, as we said before, estrogen changes, progesterone changes, insulin changes, cortisol changes, chronic inflammation. Okay, so this is a really, really critical thing that we need to understand, and we can change this. This is all short term. This is all happening in the next 48 hours after you've been training. So this is a critical one. All right, let's push it out a little bit further. So let's go into a more of a shorter term. So let's go over a space of a week or thereabouts. There's a few things that become really important. So the first one is neuro neurocognition. What I mean by neurocognition is that there is ample research now showing that when we overtrain or when we've been through a hard training session, the result of that is that the brain drops down in performance. Okay, and there's a lot of research on that now that's, that's coming through. Uh, in fact, the French rugby team's also done research on that showing that when they um, have a hard game, for the next two or three days, neurocognition actually significantly drops off. So why is this important, you ask? I know you're thinking that way. The main reason for it is we know that there is a direct correlation between neurocognition levels and potential injury risk. Okay, so if we're having a drop off in neurocognition, in other words, brain function, if we have a drop off on that, you're gonna increase your risk of injury, let alone a whole lot of other things as well in terms of performance, uh, technique, etc., etc. So this becomes really important. So the few things that are important for this. First one is rest, okay? So we need to recover. We need adequate time to rest. You can't just go, 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 go. You need to rest and recover. Another one which is really important is vagal stimulation. So this is why you hear cold um, showers, ice baths, things like this, because what you're doing is stimulating vagal activity and that's helping to improve this as well. The other big one that's really important is sleep, okay? So sleep is where we um, kind of uh, and put everything together that we've learned in the day, consolidate it, if that's the right word, uh, and uh, bring it to a higher task. So even if you're learning a new technique, a new dance routine, a uh, new uh, gymnastics move, a new technique for your backhand, it's overnight while you're asleep that that really becomes consolidated and gets properly learned. So you can spend hours and hours and hours every day, but if you don't sleep, you're still not gonna learn it, okay? So sleep is really important to improve neurocognition uh, and uh, regenerate that too. The next one is blood supply and oxygen. Oxygen is a great way to heal. Now, I don't just mean breathe oxygen, but there's a whole lot of different ways we can do that. So we can do that, for example, through hyperbaric. Uh, and there's some up and coming research on that showing that hyperbaric therapy is really important for this as well. Uh, that also comes under tissue repair. We can kind of put these two things together in that regard. Uh, red light therapy is another one that works really well for this type of thing. So red or near infrared light stimulates fibroblast activity, which stimulates muscular and tissue healing and growth. So there's a lot of different things we can do with this as well in terms of supplements and stuff like that. But these are some of the really big ones that we can look at. Okay, let's keep moving forward now into the longer term. So now we're talking about what about over a period of months? You've got a training program that runs for uh, four, five, six months. What can we do around that regard? All right, 
So the first thing to understand is that we need progressive loading. What I mean by progressive loading is if you wanna run a marathon in October, and it's currently April right now, the issue you're gonna have is that if you just go out and run 20 Ks as your first run, your tissues and your aerobic system, your energy mechanisms aren't designed to do that, and the net result of that is going to be fatigue, neurocognition fatigue, and potential injury. So what we need to do is progressively load higher and higher and higher over a period of time from a physical perspective to allow the body to deal with that requirement. Okay, this is progressive loading. We have the same thing from a brain perspective. We need to progressively load our neurocognition. So for example, if this marathon is gonna take you four hours to run, can you maintain focus on technique for four hours? So neurocognitive training also becomes really important. There's plenty of different ways you can do this through attention training, uh, through running in different environments, uh, a lot of different ways that we can do it. But we need to progressively load physically and neurologically. And this means as well, not only from uh, a, uh, a number of Ks, but also from an energy mechanism we need to progressively load. Let me explain what I mean by this. If we look at our energy pathway, so something called our Krebs cycle, there's two ways into it. So one is via glucose, the other is via fat. So both of these come in and the end result of that is we end up with this beautiful thing called energy. So these two pathways run together but they also run independent of each other. And when we do certain types of activity, we tend to favor stimulating one over the other. So for example, if you go into a high intensity interval session where you're really flogging yourself for interval training, you're more likely to be dependent upon this pathway. If you're doing another session where you're looking at more of a calm, kind of long endurance, you're more likely to use the other pathway, this pathway through here, as opposed to this top one here. So the difference is that as you stimulate these, just like any muscle in the body, if you stimulate them, their function changes. So they adapt to that stimulation. So they can increase the dependency on this or increase the dependency on this pathway based upon how you use them. So when we're looking at training patterns, if we just do high intensity interval training and just promote this pathway, we become more and more and more and more dependent upon glucose as our energy source. And if we go back to where we were here, we start looking at glucose as our primary energy source, we get a greater dependency on insulin for our functionality, and the result of that becomes again inflammation. Okay? In addition to this as well, we also know that when we keep pushing that pathway, become more and more and more flight or fight dominant, and as that occurs, that changes our vagal tone, which also affects our recovery. So what we start seeing is that we need to, even when we're looking at our training programs, we need to have a balance between high intensity training and low intensity training or endurance aerobic type training in order to maintain our longevity. Okay, so this is really, really critical that we need to have. So energy mechanisms play a part. The other thing we need to look at is our neurocognitive balance. In other words, keeping our brain balanced. So if we keep pushing one aspect of brain function over and over and over, such as flight or fight that we're getting from this area here, we'll start getting imbalances in the brain. As we get imbalances in the brain itself, the result of that imbalance is that we start favoring one aspect over the other. We start getting asymmetry in muscular function. We start getting asymmetry in muscular tone. We start getting asymmetry in range of motion. And the net result of that is potential increase in injury once again and decrease in performance. So looking at keeping the brain balanced through various types of activities, um, such as running versus cycling, uh, such as uh, swimming versus uh, basketball, keeping the brain balanced in different aspects of health and what we do call cross training becomes really, really important. What also becomes important if you really wanna be elite and really wanna get away uh, ahead of everyone is to specifically do neurocognitive balance work and neurocognitive training. Here we do this through neurospecs, which are a very specific form of stroboscopic glasses that we utilize here in a way that we've developed over the years to balance all this stuff out. Um, and also using programs like NeuroTracker and the like, which actually train uh, neurocognition, actually improve brain function uh, in a sport specific manner as well. So there's a lot of different things that we can do with this. So what I want to show in terms of recovery is recovery is not just as simple 
as taking some magnesium, uh, taking an ice bath or anything like that. There is a complexity to recovering and getting up to perform day after day that doesn't just happen from an energy perspective, that isn't just inflammatory. It's a combination of neurology, autonomic nervous system, muscular balance, biochemistry, uh, long-term training plans, patterns, all of these things come together to form recovery. And out of all of those things, biochemistry in terms of what you take supplement-wise is probably the least effective or the least important out of everything we've covered here today. You'll get way more uh, benefit from structuring a good quality training program, from having a good quality cool down, from controlling systemic inflammation on a long-term basis than you will from taking a supplement that just drives one of these things. And we can talk about supplements uh, for hours and hours and hours about what you can take to improve different parts of these pathways and the like. But this is not what I want to talk about today. What we really want to do is talk about how you can approach recovery in a systemized, logical fashion that will have long-term benefits for your career as an athlete and for your performance um, in day-to-day -day life as well. Anyway, guys, if you have any questions or all that, uh, please post them up. Um, always here to chat and help out in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm Trevor Chikuti from SpineWise, and I hope you've gotten something out of this video. Please remember to like, subscribe, uh, click the buttons, and there's more of these type of videos coming your way. Speak to you soon.